Um, so, first of all, since some of these things might be slightly controversial, I would like to say that I do not want to detract or criticize Swedish work that has gone into lower smoking, lower tobacco use, international advocacy. I don't want to do that, because in terms of lower smoking, it is all fine, and that should be respected and valued. However, I do intend and want to criticize fairly serious mistakes and ethical failures that have actually happened within the framework of Swedish tobacco control. Um, I believe that if we can correct those mistakes and set the record straight and communicate this at home and abroad, Sweden could actually, again, have a massive positive difference and effect on global public health. So I've stolen this from the Swedish Night. I have no financial conflicts of interest whatsoever. I'm not receiving payment from any tobacco companies or any e-cigarette companies. This is a fantastic picture. It is taken from Swedish Match. I hope they do not mind too much. This brand, Etam, in its current formulation has actually been on sale in Sweden since 1822. So pretty much 100 years before Marlboro was Marlboro or the Coca-Cola bottle or any other, other iconic consumer brand <coughs> came out. Um, again, we have seen this before and, and I think it's one of the most important things to note is that in Article 1, which actually signifies the lens through which the entire rest of the convention should be viewed, it says a range of supply, demand, and harm reduction strategies that aim to improve the health of a population by eliminating or reducing their consumption of tobacco products and exposure to tobacco smoke. Now, snus is 98% harm reduced. There are some issues on that number, if it's 95 or 99, not that much of a difference. That this is what this is sort of the range that we're talking about, almost two orders of magnitude. Snus consumption lowers the mean weight of dry weight tobacco consumption per year by 50%. Snus lowers exposure to tobacco smoke by 100%, both to the user and any other bystanders. And by any way of standards of looking at the issue, I cannot see how that does not fit absolutely perfectly well into the FCPC Article 1.D on harm reduction. Now, of course, that would be, in, I mean, everybody understood this in 2005 and 2003, and this is incredibly impractical because we have this product in Sweden that is used by pretty much 50% of the population. So, what do we do? Ah, we change the text. So, according to Swedish Public Health Agency, the FCTC is a series of strategies to reduce demand for tobacco, supply of tobacco, and accessibility to tobacco. Ah, there we go. Problem solved. Uh, with regards to also the harm reduction, um, the FCTC is so basically you should. It's more important that you look at the that, that you look at the slides and that you listen to me. Um, human rights permeate and were supposed to be the basis of foundation for the FCTC and tobacco control work, but when it, in terms of harm reduction, when people argue different ways of getting around the actual problem, reducing harm from tobacco not supplied, can't do that because it's zero. Reducing harm from tobacco not demanded by customers, you can't do that either, it's also zero. So the only products that are actually applicable for harm reduction are tobacco or alternative nicotine delivery system products. They're the only ones that are applicable. Um, also, in the FCTC, there are 38 articles covering two strategies, harm uh, uh, supply reduction and demand reduction. There are zero articles in the FCT that make any reference whatsoever to harm reduction. So if there's a third strategy mandated in the FCTC, which is harm reduction, then I would argue that harm reduction products must be regulated entirely outside the FCTC. We should not be looking at them from the FCTC 
perspective. We should be looking at them from a consumer product perspective or from a health benefit perspective or any other perspective, but not staring, out, staring blind into the other articles in the SETC that are not really applicable to this product. Um, so, this is what Sweden needs you to believe with regards to snowsuits. Okay? And also the gentleman chewing Bethel nuts over there in the corner, he is very, very important because that, then you also get the narcotic issue. That, this is really nasty stuff. And of course, blonde Helga with, with, with you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and um, kind of hillbilly Joe six pack and his buddy drinking beer out in the woods hunting, hunting for bears. Um, this is what um, the Karolinska Institute, in, this is how they communicate. This is, and very often you will see the Karolinska Institute's um, logotype on these types of, of presentations because they are anchored in the legitimacy of the Karolinska Institute that also, of course, give out the Nobel Prize. And you can't beat that. Anywhere in the world, you cannot beat that. So, most of these risks point to are actually, it looks really, really bad. But just as, as uh, Konstantinos said yesterday, and also many of the other more prominent scientific uh, talks, basically they are non-existent or so low that they are not of any population, pop, as a population health relevant um, numbers. There's very little of what that actually says is any potential harm for healthy normal human beings. But this is what it looks like, and this is what they would like you to see. This is again what they would like you to see. This is from a Swedish in independent think tank, Tobias Fakta. This is how they, this is what they want you to see. This is from the dentists against tobacco. This is what they want you to see and believe, and the feeling that they want to associate with news use when they communicate in Sweden and abroad. Again, this is the general picture that they would like people in the world to believe and perceive from SNOOPS. How does, what does SNOOPS actually, what does it look like in 2016? Well, the majority looks like this. This is, this is what it looks like. Yours truly, there's a TV star that is the ex-Minister of Trade for Sweden. Um, and this is a much better representation of what the general snus use is in 2016. And it has taken 50% of market share in Sweden, and it does not seem to have any relevant population level harmful effects. Now, this we have also seen from an earlier speaker today. This is just another version of it, where you can absolutely follow over 100 years what happened to snus use, what happened to cigarette use, and then I added that little thingy down there, which is uh, nicotine replacement therapy box that they currently sell today with free marketing, no tobacco tax, in all channels. They sell 82,000 day doses of NRTs uh, a year in Sweden, so 82,000 users. We know that there's somewhere around 90% failure rate on that, and then there are there are consistently about 1 million snus users in Sweden and now only 1 million uh, cigarette smokers down from approximately double. So I took that and just made a different version of it where in 1910, up here, you see, 34%, um, 0 to 99 males in Sweden were using snus. So say 4 in 10 Swedes, Swedish men were using snus. It went down to 350,000 users, where you still have 10% men in as of between 16 and 16 and 65, pretty much 10%. Back up again to 1 million users today, 20% approximately male snus use. But the interesting thing about this is that never ever in the last century has daily exclusive snus use been lower than what daily smoking is among men in Sweden today. So basically we have 100 years of data that should be there. Where is it? So in 1964, where we were at Snusius absolute lowest, the Surgeon General report came 
arguing for looking at alternative sources of nicotine. What did we do? Z. Nothing. In 1970, we bottomed out completely, and in 1980, portion snus was introduced, and as you can see, market took off. There's a, there was marketing, which I think is perfectly ethical in, in the general sense of things, but still nothing. Absolutely nothing. So this is what we have in articles in Swedish uh, medical journals, research, etc. on snus. Nothing. Zip. All the way up until 1995. From then on, we have hundreds of articles in Swedish medical journals, a lot of lobby work, a lot of PR, but we still have zero clinical harm. Zero. That doesn't mean the number is zero, it does mean that it is indistinguishable from non-users of SNPs. We cannot tell them apart. So, how does this, how does this, this is, this is obviously nuts. Everybody understands that this is obviously nuts. How does it work that this little country with so obvious data keeps this shiny chimera going globally? That's something that is, it's monumental, it's unique to Sweden, it's huge, and there's very little doubt. How do we keep this going year after year after year until 2016? Here is a set of questions from a professor at Karolinska from 1997. In healthy young individuals, the physical risks of snus use are probably low, but for individuals with heart problems, such as past MI, angina, high blood pressure, or other CVD, snus use probably increases risk for complications or premature death. Two questions. Total count mortality does not seem to differ from never users of tobacco. That's the third question. These are, these are fairly important and profound questions. And when asked to comment on them in another setting, 20 years later, suddenly snus causes GI cancer, which is, this, this is really profound, and I want, to, I want to point your attention to it, because there may be, possibly, that we have 50 excess cases of pancreatic cancer a year from snus use in Sweden. Maybe, possibly, it's very difficult to say. Um, this is going, I am running out of time, and I'm not running out of slides. Um, ooh, anyway, okay, this is Karolinska. Here, what does the National Board of Health and Welfare have to say? They say that uh, the effect of the intervention snus, there is no scientific evidence to assess snus, and on health economics, they say it's not possible to assess because the National Board of Health and Welfare has not searched for nor produced any health economic calculations. So they haven't, they haven't checked. And I pointed that out to them in 2009, 11, 13, and 15, when they do their bi-yearly revisions, and the text is still the same. What does the public health agency have to say on the topic since 2005? Well, the FCTC is a series of strategies to reduce demand for tobacco, supply of tobacco, and accessibility to tobacco. Not harm enough. It's gone. And that solves a lot of problems. What did the lawmakers say? Well, in 2016, irrespective of the assessments of facts regarding snus as a cessation method, or snus harm reduction properties compared to cigarettes, we conclude that the tobacco policy position is that no difference may be made between the different forms of tobacco. End of story. So we don't care, we are not going to recognize it, we don't want to recognize it. And that, that actually makes me a bit ashamed of being Swedish. Um, should we actually tell you what's going on? Uh, well, what I was trying what I was trying to show you is I was trying to paint a picture of what we're actually talking about. In the 60s, we only had that. In the 80s, we had professionalized institutions working with the media, and these are this is the public sphere. We had absolute exclusion of industry. We had uh, massive amounts of funding and a institutionalized uh, access to these funds in universities and research institutes. 
We then have a fantastic Jeep-like, very rugged vehicle that uh, if you stand in the way of it, it will crush you. And if you are anywhere in this system and you have an opposing view, the momentum of this vehicle will crush you. And what this leads to, I'm afraid, is that this is a rather comfortable ride for the people who are sitting up top over human rights, over health and over ethics in the public sphere, and over health, science, and reason in the private university sphere. So I thank you very much for your attention, and if you would like these slides or more information regarding them, please just contact me and I will send them to you.